Okay, greetings brothers and sisters. So this is my video I make every year where I talk about some sort of a theme for the year. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've been doing this since I think 2018. I'll read a list of the years and I'm going to do a little bit of a twist this year. Uh, change it up just a little bit um, and add something. But before I do that, um, there was one more little thing to say about Barbie. Somebody sent me a kind of a disturbing video about um, where Barbie's origin possibly came from. It's a video called Nazi Sex Dolls in Space, a YouTube video. I'm not going to show you the first part of the video uh, and the end of it. I'm just going to show you the the Barbie section of it uh, but uh, it's kind of interesting and you know this, with everything else in the sort of material world the world of Hollywood the world of celebrity culture the world of business when you dive into it deeper it just keeps on getting worse right like I wouldn't have expected it with Barbie <laughs> Like, I, you know, Barbie was whatever, you know, Barbie was, a materialistic fashion doll, you know, these things. And, you know, before this, I saw the movie, which, you know, I made a, a video, obviously, the first video was Barbie, Barbie sucked worse than I could have imagined. Poor production values, no, you know, I would have thought there would be like a good joke or a few, you know, reasonably good jokes. I mean, it was supposed to be somewhat of a comedy. I thought I would have laughed out loud, you know, something in the movie, but there was none of that. And then there was the agenda, the, the male-hating agenda, which turned out to be completely bogus. And then they made the creator of Barbie, uh, Ruth Handler, into some sort of an icon. But when uh, you pulled back the curtain on her, you found out that she ran the company from 1945 to 1975. You realize the premise of the movie which was that men had created Barbie, you know, uh, the patriarchy had created Barbie as a way to diminish women's, uh, you know, self-esteem and make their body consciousness, uh, you know, their, uh, you know, body awareness and body consciousness and have this unachievable goal of looking like Barbie and have this, you know, these model-esque dolls, you know, they did this uh, what Barbie's proportions would be like in real life, how skinny she was, and how big-breasted she was. And that was done by a woman, and it wasn't done by a man, right? <laughs> and that wasn't done by the patriarchy. But then you find out she based the doll on her daughter, uh, the Barbie doll on her daughter, and the Ken doll on her son, who turns out to be gay and died of AIDS. And then she lied about her son and said he died of uh, whatever it was, a uh, brain tumor or something like that. But he really died of AIDS and he was gay and he wasn't, he was Barbie's sister. I mean, brother. Barbie was his sister and they were marketed as boyfriend and girlfriend. They had, you know, short brown, they had dark hair, black hair, brown hair. And they were um, Jewish and they were marketed as these blonde sort of Christian, Anglo type of, you know, these dolls were. Model S dolls, and they the kids were f anything f but that, right? You know, imagine making a doll, and a, you, you know your mom made you a, a doll if you're a, you know if you're a girl, and especially for women. And the mom said, "Look, I'm going to make a doll and name it after you. It's going to be based on you, but it's going to look way better than you do." <laughs> you know, I mean that she even did that to her daughter, right? Like, it's going to be completely different than you. It's going to be, she's going to be blonde and skinny and big-breasted. She's going to be a model, and she's going to be materialistic and all about clothing and these things. Uh, superficial, no real substance. And that was the whole premise and base of the movie, that Barbie had more substance, and Barbie was a feminist. And, you know, in the sense that she was, a, you know, a businesswoman, Ruth Handler, you know, yeah, I guess that's true to some extent. She was a feminist. She ran the company. And then it turns out she was a convicted felon. Her partner was a guy who liked to party. He, he married Jaja, Jaja Gabor, a famous actress. He was uh, you know, addicted to prostitutes and cocaine. 
and he killed himself. And, you know, the Barbara Handler was convicted of fraud and things that she did with the company and chased out of the company that she built based on her, you know, poor handling of it. She got breast cancer and she said she got distracted and she lost her self-esteem because of it. So she developed a prosthetic breast a company that was used not only for women with breast cancer but women who wanted to look like they had bigger breasts or whatever which she seemed to be obsessed about because of the Barbie and all that that she inflicted on little girls you know she was the original Kardashian mom <laughs> you know, like she was that you know that's who she was and then so to add to it I, I get sent this video uh, let's get into it here soon to conquer the world with its soft power. Barbie, you're beautiful. You make me feel my Barbie doll is really real. A businesswoman, Ruth Handler, was traveling Europe on the lookout for any novel commercial possibilities. She alighted on an adult doll called Bild Lily. So Beer Lily, um, the first part of this video, the first five minutes, talk about how the Nazis were upset about, you know, the Nazi, whatever, the, the leadership. When they conquered France, their soldiers were engaging with French prostitutes and were getting syphilis. And so they created a sex doll that was very lifelike and made out of, uh, you know, plastic, rubber, whatever it was. Sort of state of the art, right? So well, this is the first sort of sex dolls. And they ended up smelling like burnt rubber. They got rid of them. Ended up not working out. But then they made a smaller version for men. And this was, you know, the, the, the origin or the inspiration behind Barbie. Marketed to men in German barbers. Bild Lily was identical to Burghilda, though with a spicy suggestiveness. Burghilda was uh, was the, the the doll that the Nazis had created. Mrs. Ruth Handler bought three examples of the Nazi sex doll's descendant. Then, on returning to the U.S., she ordered exact copies to be made, although neutered, aimed at children, and renamed after her daughter, Barbie. So again, look at her daughter and imagine this girl who grew up with this doll and it was like an idealistic what her mother wished she looked like, right? <laughs> you know, it's going to be named after you but it's going to be nothing like you, you know, like this is the whole self-esteem, body consciousness thing. Soon three were being sold every second and Barbie Boulevard became the name of a corner of New York's Times... So, um, think about this, this was on Times Square. This is Ken, her son, who ended up being gay. In real life, he's a gay, you know, he was married, and then he came out as gay when he got AIDS. Barbie, you're the only doll for me. It's got a heart here. So, they marketed this incestual relationship, you know, because this was the origin story. It was based on her kids. Um, so, it's really twisted, really weird, right? Just, um, you know. Square. Barbie would conquer the world as the ambassador of consumerism and her company be voted number one in Who Made America? Andy Warhol. In 1992, a teen talk Barbie was released, a doll that spoke a number of phrases, the first two being, Will we ever have enough clothes? And, I love shopping. Kaboom. Barbie became the chirpily innocent agent of unbridled yeah, capitalism. Meet me at the mall. Cool. For with her talking chip... Meet me at the mall. Barbie spread her epidemic disease, one that her forebear, Burkhilda, could have no cure for. I love to shop, don't you? I love to shop, don't you? I love to shop, don't you? Barbie, the ubiquitous fairy, would substitute shopping for sex organs by casting a consumerist spell and telling her 35 billion owners that the world's only there to be commercially overcome. 
So you understand this, the commercial, uh, the commercialism that now exists in the modeling, you know, makeup world, fashion world, especially now with influencers and the Kardashians being billionaires, you know, these brat dolls, these living brat dolls that are just the next level of Barbiedom, right? Where human women are getting plastic inserts and having plastic surgery, right? That's what they called it. So that came from Barbie, which was inflicted by a woman. It wasn't a man. It wasn't the patriarchy. It wasn't some, you know, uh, men getting together and creating this, uh, you know, this nightmare scenario and women's body consciousness and body issues and, you know, all this stuff with women competing with each other and unrealistic goals and even the most beautiful women having to hold a standard that they can't with aging and just, you know, having children and all these things, putting on weight, being skinny or all the, you know, eating disorders, all the stuff that came out of this that women complain about. You know, this was inflicted by a woman. This was started by a woman who went to this, you know, I mean, based in what this video says, and again, you know, I mean, I it, it says, it sounds kind of about right, right? Goes in and finds these Nazi sex dolls and use it into some materialistic shopping and targeting women instead of targeting men, targeting women, and then how this is all played out with the modeling industry and the fashion industry and, you know, now influencers who are such a big part of this, you know, this um, modern day internet movement and all the money that's spent on makeup and fashion and plastic surgery and all these ways of enhancing yourself. This was a woman-on-woman -woman crime. It wasn't the patriarchy, like they tried to say in the movie. Makes the whole movie just, uh, you know, more BS than it actually was. Like, the whole thing is a lie and a disaster. The number one movie of the year, $1.4 billion in gross. And there'll be, you know, possible sequels or whatever. And it's a disaster. It's bad for women. And, you know, they're looking at some kind of a champion feminist... Uh, you know, some kind of a feminist achievement, but it's based in lies. All this information was there and available to the director and writers of this movie, and they would have realized their whole premise and the way that they were, you know, it had an agenda, their agenda, the way they were targeting men and, you know, victimizing women as being, you know, victims of the patriarchy. It was all a lie. <laughs> the whole thing, right, was the opposite of what's true. I mean, like the literal opposite of what's true. And so, um, you know, that's Barbie. So there's one more thing I want to add to this. You know, I, I did this in the beginning a little bit, right? When I first started making truther videos. And that is, I came in with a point of view. And as truthers, we always want to say that the government's lying to us, the media's lying to us, whatever. And the specific part of our agenda. And so if you're a QB or if you're a flat earther, you want to frame the narrative so it supports your worldview, that the earth is flat. So NASA is always going to be liars and, you know, all these things, right? Anything that shows you the earth is round is a doctored photo. I mean, these types of ways that you, you know, you want to shape your narrative. And when you're doing the research, you're going to come up with stuff that questions your narrative. You're going to come up, of course, the mainstream media and the mainstream story is always the official story is going to say things that are against your narrative. And as you do research and you, you, know, you dig things up, you know, people said I did such great research on this Barbie stuff. You know, people sent me some stuff and the rest was there easy to find. So it took me five minutes. But there's a, you know, a book written by a guy named Oppenheimer, which I covered in my last video. Not the Oppenheimer, but that's weird because Oppenheimer movie had tied to Barbie movie, you know, Barbieheimer, all that stuff. But this book is out there that documents all these things and it's easy to find. And I didn't know who Ruth Handler was till I watched the movie. And so Greta Gearwig and the other people who made that movie who did the research, they brought her to our attention. How many people knew Ruth Handler was the inventor of Barbie? Nobody knew that. And the president of Mattel. Most people didn't know that, right? And I found out that through the movie. And then within a couple of days, 
I found all this other information, which blows up the idea, the narrative that she wanted to make, which was a feminist narrative, right? This was a feminist movie with a feminist agenda, Hollywood agenda, with a feminist writer and a, a director. And she wanted to blame the patriarchy, and we see this now all the time. You know, not that the patriarchy is... I'm not a fan of the patriarchy. The patriarchy does exist to whatever extent, right? I understand there's some truth in that. But she wanted to blame the patriarchy for not only Barbie phenomenon, but this whole idea of men making women fight each other and making women materialistic and obsessed with their appearance and you know competing with each other by buying clothes and getting plastic surgery and doing these things and having body image issues and all the stuff that women have which has been inflicted by women and to some extent gay men who run the fashion industry and they run the modeling industry. Like if you see these shows, these modeling shows and any of these TV shows that have modeling and fashion at, fashion at the center, you'll find a lot of women and gay men who are, you know, a part of that industry. You don't find many straight white men running this, you know, these types of things. And you find that in, in many of these... Um, you know, these different jobs that are related to marketing to women. But ironically, if you look into it, when you find out where feminism came from, that came from men, right? Men wanted to diminish the role of motherhood. Men wanted mothers to, you know, feel like they were incomplete by just being moms, you know, just a mom, that you also had a career as well, because that made them, uh, you know, an employee. They were feeding the beast, it also made the you know economy grow, and it created division within the family, and it you know led to divorces because women now could support themselves financially. So it helped the divorce business and splitting up the family. This was all done by men and the CIA, and you know the the, the, the feminism movement was created by men, and this stuff that they try to uh, blame the patriarchy for in Barbie movie was done by women. And they found that out. Like, they found it out. They, If I know it, they know it. And they chose to not say that. They chose to go along with their narrative and go against the information they knew made what the movie was about completely BS. You know, a movie with an agenda, a movie pushing an agenda, all of the agenda, like even with the brother and sister, Barbie being brother and sister in real life, all these things, right? I mean, there's a real-life Barbie, and there's a real-life Ken, and their brother and sister and Ken's gay. So, you know, I mean, that's origin stories matter, as I said before. And so with all of that, she chose to make the movie anyway. The movie sucked on its own merits and its own quality, but also it was just complete, a complete lie and fabrication. And like I said, when I first started making truther videos, I would use pictures that like, let's say I was making vid videos about like Michelle Obama possibly being a dude. I use the pictures that made her look like a dude, right? If there's ones that made her look more f feminine, I didn't use those pictures. And I realized that was not, you know, fair. Like that wasn't, you know, I was, it was being deceptive. If I'm saying that I'm a truther person and I'm presenting truth in a way that the mainstream media doesn't do, then I have to be honest with myself and not, you know, embellish or fabricate things. I mean, people are always going to do that anyway. It's hard not to do that with confirmation bias but to be aware of it, right? And clearly the makers of Barbie and, you know, I mean, all of these things that went along with it are are not doing what, you know, they are, they're being full-on deceptive. And who are they being deceptive to? Isn't to men. You know, men aren't going to buy into this message. Who are the ones that are buying into Barbie? It's feminist women. And so the feminists that they claim to be a part of, they're lying. That's the audience they're lying to, right? When you lie, you're lying to your audience, the audience that supports you, the audience that trusts you and has faith in you, the audience is... You have to understand this. When Alex Jones lies, he's lying to truthers, right? And so it's your audience that you're hurting. People who are, you know, again, who are supposed to be on your side, people like you, people who support you, and, and these things. You have a responsibility to your audience. They're not hurting men. Barbie movie isn't really hurting men, right? I mean, it's actually kind of a, you know, a deal breaker for a man when he realizes, oh, wow, this woman likes Barbie, you <laughs> know? It's a warning sign flashing, you know, get out, right? So it's actually kind of helpful to men. It was helpful to me in making this video because of all the things I talk about in terms of these 
you know the feminist woke agenda here and it was clearly just all that right it's they're they're putting it on a t and making it easy for me to make videos like this about their their faulty worldview and so it didn't hurt any of us it hurt women it hurt feminist women particularly just like barbie did anyways let's get into the um 2024 okay so let's get into the year of here i um you know i started this in 2017 and i didn't do it before the year um i started it in the middle of the year like 2017 came around and there was the this was the year of beauty and the beast the movie beauty and the beast and then there was the beast in the um m night Shyamalan movie uh split and there was um you know a character uh, the guy had multiple personalities and one of the personalities was a character called the beast or an altar called the beast and the character was james mcavoy who also starred in a movie called filth in 2013 that i saw in that year in 2017 and it was a really bad movie he played a freemasonic cop and it was kind of a a very gross movie and uh, there was like a beast like uh, you know part of that and then there was just this beast like energy so I dubbed 2018 the year of the beast just sort of some kind of uh, just all the beast energy maybe midway through the year so it was already happening in 2018 I didn't do anything apparently I thought I had continued it the next year but then um, in 2019 I noticed there's all this stuff to do with ghouls and it had to do with uh, Celine Dion and Pete Davidson being these uh, prominent ghouls. I looked at them like, look at these ghouls, right? And it was a word I had never used before. And then I started to see ghoulish energy and ghouls everywhere, right? And so, and then it became a thing where before the year, I would see some kind of, uh, you know, a trend happening or, you know, some something would just come to me spontaneously and intuitively and I would say this year is going to, this is going to be the theme for this year I guess it was some kind of prediction in 2020 was the year of the broken 2021 the year of the schism you know division and the stuff and hatred between people of course after post-election with Trump and things it had been you know these things were were there every year but it was you know it would be something that would stand out and 2022 year of the dummy and 2023 this year was year of the effort um and there was you know just this effort energy right throughout the year and i would kind of check in you know i would lose i would forget about it and lose focus on it but you know every once in a while someone would bring it up and say this is another example of year of the effort right and um i want to do something a little bit different this year because with anything there is the negative which is what i've been focusing on and then there's the positive right and you know people have said that i'm blackpilled or um negative or whatever about what's going on in the world but in reality i think what i'm saying here is quite positive because if you look into the system the beastly system and you look into what's going on you know with people like people aren't getting better people are getting worse right you know i've said this before if you want to have hope what do you have hope in well you have hope in people you would have to have in hope that people are going to change and the leadership is getting worse and worse the you know masses the people are getting worse and worse and weaker and and, and the system is setting up to make people each generation more dependent and worse and the previous generation stupider weaker more entitled and just disconnected from god more and more unnatural more and more deviant and that's how the system is and we all can see it and so it's a bad trend that we're on the only issue is that we're 100 percent dependent on the system the beast but if you take that away then everything in your power everything in your consciousness would be we have to get this thing out of our life we have to it's a cancer it's a you know abomination it's demonic 
the economic system, the materialism, the hedonism, the ego, the selfishness, the division, you know, all these things, the ghoulishness, the people just being dead inside, the zombie, zombific- zombification of the of humanity, the ghouls, the the spiritual vampires, you know, the people being internally bankrupt and have to suck off energy, sucking off energy off of other people and things like this. And so it's just a system that should in all, you know, in every possible way disappear. And what we're doing to the world, the pollution, the, you know, the overuse of resources, the killing of other, you know, the extinction of other species. I mean, everything that's going on right now with humanity is bad. We're going the wrong direction. Families, you know, have been devastated. There's no more family. People having alternative lives now in the cyber world, so much so that kids grow up and say, in the real world, this is in the real world, IRL. And that is because they spend most of their time in a cyber world. And so they're not even in the real world anymore. And the cyber world is even worse. And everything that it, you know, exists, one third of it is pornography. And then all the other bad things that are there. And the way people treat each other online and their negative tendencies coming out. Loneliness and, you know, depression and suicide and things like this. I mean, all the things that these kids grow up with. And so the system being taken down is a good thing. You know, it is only a bad thing because of how it'll affect us because we're so need, need-based need and dependent on the system. But if you take that out of the equation, then everything about the system collapsing is good. And so the apocalypse is a good thing. And so I'm not being negative by, you know, it's, the hope is in, that we can do something better when the system goes in a you know you know goes away, and that something better is to connect to God internally, and build the system with a relationship with our souls and the divinity within us, and a collective that's better for the you know not the individual but better for everybody. You know I've talked about this with the psycho- psychological world. You know I have a master's in counseling, and the DSM five is loaded with diagnoses and those diagnoses are all negative right are all in some way you know about the individual being broken but there's no diagnosis about there's no contributing factor which is that the system itself is you know the system's great but you but you're messed up the individual is messed up but the system's great and we're told in every possible way how great our system is and especially the economic system and how lucky we are to have it but we're not lucky at all because it disconnects people from the divinity within them and turns them into some egotistical demonic ab- abomination and so it's not negative at all right so these things are in the sense negative but with everything there is potential you know there's the opposite side of it so if you have pleasure you have pain if you have good you have bad or you have light you have darkness they're they're all connected in a, a binary system in some way right everything has its opposite so if it's the year of the beast you know the antonyms for beast are you know being civilized or being angelic or being sweet you know being soft these things and so the potential is to do that like the opposite is there as well where you can be you you know a better version of yourself the best version of yourself some becoming something getting rid, rid of your your negative animalistic tendencies and evolving into something more something more refined right the opposite is there in every one of these occasions right if if you have the if you have um a ghoul and you know what the opposite of a ghoul is you know opposite of a vampire or zombie or ghoul or these things is being alive being truly alive and waking up and you know being Somebody who has something to give, you know, not some life-sucking, zombie-like, ghoul-like creature that's sucking energy off of the, you know, the uh, other people in the system, but having something to contribute, having something like a life within you, some prana, some some divine energy to share with other people. Of course, being broken, the opposite of that is being functional, being competent, being a, a better person. So instead of being a victim that's broken be something that's you know uh, a competent functioning human being who's connected to God and is helping and contributing has something to offer society of course schism the idea of the division that separates people and the 
you know, schism is even a like a, a deeper word than the you know the conflict that exists now, especially with the the Democrats and the Republican. But be somebody who's a uniter, be something that you know. These are the the things that are also there with you know it's the potential to be you know on a positive level. It's to be a uniter. The year the dummy, you know, the potential was there to be wise, right? Because dummy isn't so much as being stupid as making bad decisions and doing dumb things, right? And doing the wrong thing and being, you know, a village idiot or whatever it is. But doing, you know, being functional, right? Again, being functional and competent and, and having, you know, wisdom. And so this past year, the year of the F it, right? The year of the boop it. Um, this is when I brought in the boop too. <laughs> boop. Um, you know, that could be negative or positive because you can just say F it and like go for it, right? You can, F it can be a positive thing if you, you know, if you finally say, all right, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to throw off my shackles and, and just throw caution to the wind and, and, you know, it could be positive, like there's a positive way of saying F it and a negative way of saying F it. You know, and it kind of was summed up. I watched the Dallas Cowboys Detroit Lions football game. And at halftime, Jimmy Johnson, who was a legendary coach of the Dallas Cowboys, and I think they won two Super Bowls and maybe a third Super Bowl after he was fired by Jerry Jones and they like hated each other because both of them wanted credit for their success Jerry Jones took over the team and he wanted to you know have his own Super Bowl champions and Jimmy Johnson was like a big personality kind of a hard ass and you know there was a competition in their egos and a falling out and like they hated each other for years there was like a feud there and last night um, they put the feud aside and Jimmy Johnson was introduced to the ring of honor Troy Aikman was the guy who was um you know the announcer he was a quarterback Jimmy Johnson's quarterback and he um you know the Dallas Cowboys and he was the announcer he came down and he had somehow orchestrated a a sort of a truce between Jimmy Johnson and Jerry Jones right and all of his players there Emmett Smith and um Michael Irving, Emmett Smith was a running back. Michael Irving was a receiver, and some of the other defensive players were there. And you know, and there's these legendary Cowboys players. Now, Cowboys were my first favorite football team. You know, I have things where I, you know, I don't root for the local team. I grew up in Connecticut, where there was no teams. There's the Hartford Whalers, which were an absolute joke, and they no longer exist. I think they're the Carolina or something or other now the franchise move. So there was no f- professional teams in Hartford in Connecticut, a small state. And so we were between uh, New York and Boston. And there are people in Connecticut who were Boston fans and some who are New York fans. And I was neither. Like I, you know, <laughs> I didn't like either of those teams. I've always been sort of that kind of person. And I'm not a person that goes along with what everyone else is doing or whatever. And so when I was a kid, I started to like, you know, my own teams that were just from different places in the country. And, you know, I was, I went on a Delta Airlines flight to Florida with my family. And this is back when they had like full service and, you know, better meals. And there was some glamour in going on a flight, right? When flights were celebrated for the magical thing that they are, which is you could get on a plane and fly, right? You were in the sky flying at a very fast speed. And you could get a deck of cards, and it, and each deck of cards, you know, had the Delta stuff on it, and the you know, the airline stuff on it, and they had a city. And I was the first time I ever got a deck of cards. It was for Dallas, the city of Dallas. And then shortly after that, I went to a department store. This is before there were, you know, malls were just becoming a thing, and they had these glamorous department stores. Like this is the you know the era of, of Barbie. And the stores would have multiple floors. And they had a, you know, a, like a sporting goods floor and they had a, a toy aisle. And these were like nice stores, right? Uh, I forget the name of the store, you know, was, um, it's out of business now. But uh, maybe I could even look it up. I thought it was named Fox and I just looked it up, right? It's called G Fox. 
department store, like Macy's in, in, in New York. And it was just a beautiful store. And I purchased, a, I was, or my dad got me a, I was in the sporting goods department, and there's a little booklet about Super Bowls. You know, it was when Super Bowls were relatively new. Like, they used to have NFL championships. There was the AFC and the NFC, and of course the AFC was was not as good, the NFC, like they did with the NBA and the the ABA. And then they decided to turn this into some sort of, uh, you know, the, the championship, NFL championship, which was later called the Super Bowl. And you know, I got this book and, you know, I was looking at it and the Cowboys had just either been in the Super Bowl or won and, you know, Roger Starbuck and these things. And that was my introduced, being introduced to the NFL, right? So I was a Cowboys fan, but now I don't like the Cowboys. Like I root against them, like as much as I care about it, but I root against them just for whatever reason. There's people who are, you know, devoted Cowboy fans and then everybody else who dislikes the or the franchise it's the number one sports franchise in the world that used to be um the um a couple of soccer clubs in england but now the cowboys have surpassed these these different you know all these uh, other worldwide sports franchise and it's the number one franchise in the world and they have a you know huge billion dollar stadium and just uh, you know all of it and so it's kind of a legendary type of thing. But I'm not a Cowboys fan. Don't like the Cowboys. Didn't like uh, Jimmy Johnson or Jerry Jones. But this was kind of a moving thing that happened. And, you know, these two guys put it aside their egos and their whatever was going on. Because um, they're both really old. Like, really, like, old. And Jimmy Johnson, like, had a stroke or something. Had some kind of health issue and missed you know he does announcing now he does like the pregame stuff and like he was barely there like I saw him when he came back I usually don't watch the pregame but I saw him and he had been gone for a couple weeks or something and the guy was a shell of himself right you know when these guys get old and it sort of antipathized the year of the effort where you know people are dying and you know all this stuff where I mean all the people are just dropping like flies and all the things that have happened and, you know, they they did this thing that they thought they invited him into the ring of honor for the Dallas Cowboys, and they both gave speeches, and the players were weeping. Michael Irving was, you know, crying throughout the whole thing, and, you know, all these, you know, these iconic figures were, you know, it was this kind of touching moment for the Cowboys franchise. And it kind of, to me, antipathized the, the year of the effort. They played the Detroit Lions, and the Detroit Lions – you know, had an opportunity to win the game. They actually won the game, but their penalty was called on a sort of a trick play for a two-point conversion for those of you who saw the game. The Detroit Lions was a loser franchise, just they were constantly losing. Detroit is known for having poor franchises. Um, and they hadn't won a division, their division, which includes the Packers and the Chicago Bears and the Vikings, all better franchises and better teams for years like you know like when I was a kid or something so it was 1993 and the other two times were in the 80s and before that or after that they never won their division there are four teams in the division they've won it four times you know in like you know 50 years I mean horrible just winning the division never mind winning the you know going to the Super Bowl or winning the Super Bowl or any of these things right and this year the Detroit Lions won their division they lost this game, which was kind of interesting, but the Detroit Pistons basketball team had lost more games in a row than any other NBA team in NBA history, and they finally won last night. So that was all interesting. It's kind of an epic, uh, bringing you know down the uh, the year of the effort, and then tying this thing with Barbie into it because Barbie was, you know, this uh, not just a, a uh, the biggest grossing movie. But it was a huge social statement where women were breaking up with their boyfriends and husbands after seeing the movie. And there was this anger towards men and all the propaganda. It was a whole thing there that turned out to be completely false in an epic way here that I've documented. In all the ways that, you know, the, the war between Palestine and Israel and, you know, not Palestine doesn't have an army, but all this stuff with that and the, the Ukrainian things and Hunter Biden and you know, the stuff with Trump and just 
you know, it's just um, the year of the effort, right? In ways that um, were more about how they don't care. The people controlling the system are not hiding things as much and the truth is coming out and, you know, people just dropping like flies and things are obvious and they're not even, you know, trying to, you know, pretend it's not the way it is, right? And so, um, you know, it truly was the year of the effort. And so that brings us to 2024, the year of the amateur. <laughs> and so um, what happened was maybe a couple months ago, three months ago, I think in the summer sometime, I was like, it's amateur hour out here. I'm not sure what it was about. But you look at the media, the news media, certainly the political parties, and then even things to do with corporations, it's just so amateurish. You know, Barbie's an amateur movie. Like, it's not a professionally made movie. Like, it's amateur hour. And that's already heading into this year. And it hasn't even started yet. So, um, when I said amateur hour, and I heard it, like, I was I was editing the video, and I'm like, oh, next year will be year of the amateur. And, you know, I um, knew that I would probably forget, which I did. Because I, this morning, I couldn't remember what it was. But luckily, I wrote all this stuff down on a list. I went back and, and found all the other years. And now I have them uh, saved in a document that's in my video file folder where I can just, um, you know, transfer each year as I go forward. But one of the, uh, like, problems with the truth community is people in the truth community, truthers, attribute behaviors and excellence to the controllers that they don't have. You know, these are not competent people. These are people who don't do uh, great work. It's very sloppy. It's always been amateur hour. And now it's going to get worse because, you know, the forces of change are against them and, you know, things are being exposed. When you look into anything, you find that there's a lot more unprofessionalism <laughs> than you really understood. And this, you know, power, this, um, this uh, you know, sort of... Uh, infallibility that people in the truth community have when they talk about the so-called elite. You know, the elite don't have the ability to create things because they don't have any prana left. They're, you know, they're ghouls and zombies and vampires and they don't have creative energy because they've embraced the dark side and they're just dead inside. You need creative energy to manifest things. So they need the collective energy to manifest things. That's why they work so hard on doing these psychological operations to move people to create their own prisons, create their own, you know, slavery, create their own, you know, uh, you know, all of it, their own uh, abuse and things. And, you know, it's people themselves that are manifesting these things because the people that control the system don't have that ability. And, you know, they're warped. They're crazy because when you live an indulgent life, a pleasure-based life, you become crazy and, you know, disconnects you from reality. One of the great teachings of the third master of the Sajmark system was that people who have just pleasure, it, you know, pain and suffering bind your personality together. They're like the slap of reality, right? That's why that there's an opportunity. Miseries is divine blessings. When you have difficulties, when you have, you know, bills to pay, when you have things that you have to do, it makes you get out of bed. It makes you it motivates you to, to do what you have to do, overcome obstacles and things. Otherwise, you can just be completely lazy and, you know, not do anything. People who have too much vacation time, too much free time, and they don't have anything that constrains them and binds their personality together, their personality just becomes fragmented and falls apart, right? Because it's not, you need, you know, some pressure like a, a butterfly struggling to get out of the cocoon if you open it up and, uh, and help the butterfly out, it doesn't become a butterfly. Like it's just, it needs that struggle to, uh, the, the emerging from the cocoon helps it become a butterfly, right? The struggle. And so these people with a lot of money and a lot of power, they don't have that. And they just become crazier and crazier and incompetence and amateur hour becomes part of that because they're not, you know, based in reality and there's no, you know, oversight, there's no bosses, there's no, you know, people looking over their shoulders or whatever it is. And they, you know, they're not, they don't answer to anybody, God or whatever. There's no quality control. And they don't confront their failings. And they, you know, they they become so egotistical, they can't even look at themselves as being, uh, you know, doing anything wrong. And they're so weak. And, you know, that's where the incompetence comes from. 
and now that's you know translated to everybody in our system there's very few competent people out there very few professionals you know the hunter biden things the amateur hour and now as we go into this elective you know the election this year with the news media and, and you know it's the amateur hour the way they're covering trump and the way that they're covering biden and then you know all of it so you know it's already set like there's no way this is not going to happen <laughs> you know the other ones you know i had these ideas and either it either goes that way or doesn't you know it's not in my control it's just whether i was able to perceive it you, know, you can always make a case for for ghouls and and dummies and you know schism and division i mean there's these things are always present so it isn't like you know there's always ways that you can support this argument but this is going to be more of amateur hour out there like you just you know you can see it's it's kind of guaranteed right because i know the kind of people these are and i know the the kind of work they have to do and you know with all that's going on it's um you know it's that but the opposite of amateur hours is, is being competent it's being professional it's being you know somebody who is um you know good at what they're doing right and so that is the opportunity here when there's one thing there's always the other right as i said in the beginning two sides of the coin and so there's an opportunity to be to be great right to be you know next level to be somebody who you know performs on a higher level to somebody who has something to contribute and and you know has some level of excellence right and is professional in, in the way that you do things and you know all these things are you know if one thing exists then the other thing is the opportunity is, the, is there for people to do you know there'll be a lot of amateurs so you know you can be a professional there'll be a lot of uh, children and you can be an adult right and so as we move forward um, you know th those are the opportunities that everyone has to be you know somebody who's competent human being right be a competent human being that would be the you know the goal to counteract this uh you know for your own life and for yourself and your family and the people around you you know what i do here you know be a professional person be competent at your job and because people with, with competence do really well because most people are amateurs and don't want to admit it most people suck at what they do and they don't put much pride or effort into you know pride's not a good word but they don't put much into you know their their work and their and the way that they handle themselves and I, i'm not a perfectionist but at least you know being competent and being good at what you're supposed to do whether it be a you know how you are a pair as a parent how you are as a, a husband or wife how you are in your job how you are as a human being whatever you might do just do competent work right be you know someone who's not an amateur okay so that's um that wraps it up for now i'll of course be covering this as the days move forward. I mean, it'll be, it's going to be amateur hour tonight and these New Year's Eve <laughs> celebrations. I don't know if CNN is letting those guys drink again. Remember, they wouldn't let them drink because, you know, that was too much of an amateur hour there. <laughs> when they all got drunk, Anderson Cooper and Andy Cohen and all those people with them. But, you know, as we move forward, I'll just, I'll you know, at least at the beginning, I'll point out how, how this is, uh, you know, pervasive in the coming year you know 2024 is we're getting to it you know remember there was the the 2012 doomsday for the mayan calendar you know the mayan calendar ended in 2024 so there was like this idea that they, they knew something or 2012 but some people said it was really 2024 that people misread the calendar there's supposed to be a big event that's going to happen at the end of 2025 and 26 uh, per the, you know, the whispers of the brighter world prophecies in the Sajmark system. And we're teetering on the cusp of, um, you know, disaster or the end of the system. But like I said, you know, that's, it depends on how you look at it. And really, in every measurable standard, other than that we're dependent on the system, it's a good thing that the system collapses. And, you know, Trump's an amateur and Biden's an amateur. And I mean, you know, Biden should be a professional, but he's not. He's such a, like a bonehead. And then, you know, the campaigns and all these things as we, we move forward. You know, I'm kind of looking forward to the entertainment value, but because amateur issues, are, you know, amateur work is always, you know, good for me, you know, <laughs> in terms of what I cover here. But anyways, that's it for now. Only spirituality will save this world. It's Paul Romano, definitely important for the apocalypse and the ascension. Everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.